I'm going to introduce uh, Gokje. Uh, we know each other for a while, I think, uh, and this, this is an opportunity to reconnect. Uh, we met at Cornell uh, uh, some when I was an MFA. I think uh, we met at that time, Gokje. Uh, it was awesome uh, to, to uh, get to this point. <laughs> so uh, Gokje is the Associate Professor in Anthropology at Rice University. Uh, her latest book, Spaceship in Desert, uh, Energy, Climate Change, and Urban Design in Abu Dhabi, uh, was published by Duke University Press in 2019. Uh, she's focusing on the construction of renewable energy and clean technology infrastructure in the United Emirates, Emirates uh, more specifically concentrating on the Masdar City project. Uh, Dr. Gunel finished her PhD in anthropology at Cornell, and held positions at the University of Arizona and Columbia University. Her articles have been published in a wide range of journals, including Engineering Studies, Public Culture, Anthropological Quarterly, Averly Review, Polar, Log, Eflux, and South Atlantic Quarterly. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Gunel co-offered a manifesto for patchwork ethnography uh, in 2020. So uh, thank you, uh, Gokche. And uh, in the end of your talk, we're gonna have some time for folks to ask questions. I'm gonna be reading them. So feel free to use the Q&A button as, as Gokche talks about the theme and uh, ask us questions. And I'm gonna be getting to them uh, in the end of the talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Boaz, for the introduction, and thank you everyone for having me here. It's a pleasure uh, to get to know about uh, your talk series and to also sort of get uh, have the opportunity to share some of my work with you. Uh, so I'm looking forward to all their comments and questions, so uh, hopefully we'll have enough time for uh, a discussion at the end of the talk. So the talk, uh, next slide, please. Draws uh, the, um, the talk draws on my recent book, Spaceship in the Desert, Energy, Climate Change, and Urban Design in Abu Dhabi, which, as Boaz uh, said, was published by Duke University Press. And here, I'm not going to summarize the book in full, but I would rather give you, I'd like to give you a glimpse of some of the arguments I make. And I, again, I'd be happy to talk more about the project in the Q&A. So in responding to the dual problem of energy and climate change, Abu Dhabi, which is the wealthiest emirate of the United Arab Emirates, began branding itself as a leader in green innovation. In the year 2006, the Abu Dhabi government publicized its intentions to invest in renewable energy and clean technology in the form of a multifaceted state-owned company called Mazdar. And here, the hope was to ensure that the emirate remains a significant player in the energy industry well after its oil reserves run dry or become less valuable. In the following years, Mazdar, which means source in Arabic, became widely known for Mazdar City, a futuristic smart eco city that was designed by the London based architecture office Foster and Partners. Mazdar City would house 50,000 residents and 40,000 commuters on a 600 hectare area and co cost $22 billion. The site uh, that you see in this image here um, neighbored the Abu Dhabi International Airport, the Yas Marina Formula One circuit and the Al Ghazal golf course. To look at computer generated images of it, you might think it was a fantasy from a sci-fi comic, the sort I read as a boy, Norman Foster of Foster and Partners said in 2011. But Mazdar City, a university city and an environmental technology park outside Abu Dhabi is already being built. And here you can see the computer rendering of the Mazdar City master plan. And this master plan, this specific rendering was heavily publicized in the period between 2007 and 2011. Next image, please. While the eco city was central to Mazdar's vision, Mazdar also invested in renewable energy via its other operations, Mazdar Power, Mazdar Carbon, and Mazdar Capital. Mazdar Institute, the renewable energy research center that was founded by MIT, was opened inside the fledgling eco city and started offering fully funded graduate degrees to about 200 students from around the world. And so during the time of my most sort of uh, intensive field work in 2010 and 2011, these students were the only inhabitants of Mazdar city living in uh, dormitories on campus. And here in this image, you can see the Mazdar Institute dorms and labs situated at the center of Mazdar city. So the red buildings that you see there were the do dormitory buildings. Next image, please. 
So my book, Spaceship in the Desert, analyzes the production of Abu Dhabi's renewable energy and clean technology infrastructures centering on the Mazdar project. And it seeks to understand how an oil-rich emirate like the UA, like Abu Dhabi prepares for a future with less oil. So my research mainly demonstrates that Abu Dhabi's clean technology projects have aimed to generate what are called technical adjustments, which are means for vaulting over to a future where humans will continue to enjoy technological complexity without interrogating existing social, political, and economic relations. And in effect, I understand technical adjustments as very imaginative and wide ranging responses to global climate change and energy scarcity, which open up certain interventions such as extending technological complexity while foreclosing others, such as asking larger scale moral, ethical and political questions about how to live. While producing innovative and at times fun artifacts, technical adjustments eventually obfuscate and efface the simple realization that humans cannot continue to live and consume as they do. Instead, technical adjustments seek to preserve and conserve the status quo. So before I continue further and talk more about the book, I want to give you a very brief historical account of Abu Dhabi so that we can all contextualize the work that's going on here in, in the sort of the, the Emirates um, broader sort of, uh, again, history and sort of broader future goals. Next image, please. In the early 1960s, while still under British control, Abu Dhabi commanded around 10% of the world's proven hydrocarbon deposits. However, under the rule of Sheikh Shahput, often remembered for not fully complying with British interests, Abu Dhabi refused development interventions. And in this image here, you can see Sheikh Shahput photographed in 1963 by Roger Crane, a Life magazine photographer. But Sheikh Zayed, who came to power with British support in 1966, so three years after this photograph was taken and heavily publicized, um, Sheikh Zayed drastically transformed policies during his rule that lasted until his death in 2004. And he, during this period, he prioritized oil concessions and contracts. Next image, please. Sheikh Zayed was also a critical actor in founding what is now known as the United Arab Emirates in 1971, bringing together seven different independent sheikdoms that had previously been part of a British protectorate called the Trucial States. So as you can see in this map, Abu Dhabi, which is the capital of uh, the United Arab Emirates, is also the largest emirate in the union. And Dubai, which is the emirate that we hear about more often, uh, neighbors Abu Dhabi. By the 1990s, Abu Dhabi accounted for over 90% of the UAE's oil exports and had the capacity to pump 2.5 million barrels per day. And after Sheikh Zayed's death in 2004, his successor Sheikh Khalifa began to mold a more globally competitive image for Abu Dhabi, specifically by investing in high profile development projects and concentrating in the fields of um, tourism, urban transformation and technology transfer. Next image, please. So some of these projects, such as the construction of NYU Abu Dhabi, Guggenheim and Lur, received attention globally. And here's an image of the new Lur Museum, which opened in November um, 2017. So it's useful to keep in mind, however, that foreign labor designs, builds and manages these projects. Of, of the roughly 9 million people who live and work in the UAE, almost 9 million, uh, almost 8 million are not Emirati citizens. These immigrants come to the UAE on temporary renewable work contracts sponsored by their employers, and some of them hold white collar jobs in sectors such as tourism, finance and construction. While many of them are low wage male workers from South Asia and Southeast Asia. The UAE's violation of workers' rights, especially on the construction sites of large projects such as Guggenheim and NYU Abu Dhabi, are well documented by international institutions, um, as well as the media. Next image, please. Today, Abu Dhabi continues to rely on various networks of oil for expanding into the renewable energy and clean technology sectors and seeks to start exporting knowledge intensive products rather than oil. The practices adopted in promoting clean energy, such as the construction of Mazdar City, are meant to transform Abu Dhabi's image from oil producer to technology developer, rendering the Emirate, as one of my interlocutors put it, more elite. In this context, climate change and future energy scarcity have emerged as business opportunities. 
When defining their understandings of renewable energy, many of my interlocutors who came to Abu Dhabi from all over the world explained that they did not advocate closing down businesses and stopping production. Just the opposite. They imagined Mazdar City as a testbed that would create more business potential for Abu Dhabi. They did not aspire to surrender or challenge capitalist consumerism, which is often seen as the reason for dwindling resources and climate vulnerability, but instead attempted to generate a strategic, holistic, comprehensive approach to renewable energy. The producers of Mazdar City accordingly remarked that their initiative was not environmentalism and that the project did not seek to be located outside the present social, political, and economic conditions. In addition to admitting that not many of them would self-identify as environmentalists, clean technology professionals in different sectors found it significant to highlight how the environment was a sexy part of the economy and therefore could be integrated into existing models of social and political life seamlessly. Like many businesses around the world, they could supply environmentally friendly products that would perhaps supplant the demand for non-green products such as fossil fuels. Next image, please. So in the rest of this talk, I'd like to analyze the imagery, specifically the imagery employed in speaking about the futuristic Mazdar City project in the years that followed its launch in 2006. Why and how did Mazdar become conceptualized as a city of the future? And what did it mean for the project to be located at an other time? in addition to being located within a bounded area in the desert, often conceptualized as an other space. What or perhaps when was the future imagined through Mazdar City? Next image, please. A celebrated commentary regarding the futuristic aspects of Mazdar City came from Laura's blog, where she emphasized how being there felt like living in a spaceship in the middle of the desert. Laura was an American student in her mid-20s, and she had moved to Abu Dhabi from the US with an ambition to learn more about renewable energy and clean technology at the new Mazdar Institute. She, had a, she already held a bachelor's degree in engineering from a small college in Massachusetts. In September 2010, after publishing this uh, entry, Laura received unexpected attention from journalists around the world. The president of the Institute and many other media like the Guardian newspaper talked about Laura's blog when reporting on developments at Mazdar. Laura had a studio apartment on the new campus and had assumed her blog would reach a handful of friends and family members. She later searched for reasons as to why and how it had become so popular. Next image, please. Since the 1960s, space travel technologies have inspired ecologically sensitive architecture, producing a blueprint for survival in a context of rising environmental concerns. As historians of science such as Peder Anker and Sabine Hörler have noted in their overviews of ecological design developments, the American space program of the 1960s had considerable impact on, the, on how designers imagined and planned eco-friendly life on Earth. Buildings would constitute self-regulating and decentralized systems with comfortable climatic conditions for humans. They would provide enclosed shelters for an impending ecological disaster. And they would serve as means of escape from possible destruction on Earth. This is perhaps best symbolized by the well-known Biosphere 2 project, where in the fall of 1991, eight scientists entered uh, a glass and steel complex in the Sonoran Desert in Oracle, Arizona, about an hour outside Tucson, to test whether they could sustain their lives in a sealed environment. And the hope was that the model would someday be replicated to colonize outer space. Occupying buildings inspired by space technologies, humanity would behave like astronauts with clear outer space missions. And you can see the Biosphere 2 project uh, here. It's now run as a sort of a research center and a museum by the University of Arizona. Next image, please. In these histories, the spaceship is a finite, technically sophisticated and insular habitat for an exclusive group of beings facing an outside world of crises. In his book, Shipwreck with Spectator, Hans Blumenberg explains how humans prefer in their imagination to represent their overall condition in, 
the, in the world in terms of a sea voyage. The idea of the spaceship, much like the submarine that preceded it, then serves as an extension of the arc metaphor, demonstrating the inevitable boundaries of human activities, vilifying the space beyond human habitability, and producing the outside as a vacuum that should not be inhabited. As seas full of mythical monsters surround the livable environments on Earth, the ship provides a safe interior space thanks to its strict boundaries. Or as the German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk suggests, it acts as an autonomous, absolute, context-free house, the building with no neighborhood. This way, the ship puts forward an alter alternative environment of peace and rationality, standing in opposition to the destructive and irrational crises of Earth. In prioritizing enclosure for some over collective survival, which is um, the tension that underpins most spacefaring movies, the spaceship also advances the principles of selection and endorses what Sloterdijk calls exclusivity, dressed up as universalism. Despite saving only a very small number of those who suffer a metaphorical shipwreck, the spaceship insists on addressing the planetary scale questions of survival in the unknown, the sustenance of the species beyond ecological catastrophe, and the preservation of an existing civilization, albeit in highly limited and confined form. Next image, please. Mazdar City was conceived to perform the role of a spaceship in the desert, to maintain the lives and livelihoods of its residents by relying on clean technologies. Architects working with Foster and Partners based at the Mazdar City site to both monitor the design of Mazdar Institute and the sustenance of the Mazdar City Master Plan suggested that the ecological mandate assisted Norman Foster, who was the founder and chairman of Foster and Partners, as he produced his legacy having himself been inspired by the history of ecological architecture in the 1960s and 1970s. One of the on-site Foster and Partners architects told me, Norman wants to be the Bucky Fuller of this century. Next image, please. But Mr. Fuller was a multidimensional, somewhat eccentric 20th century inventor who attempted to resolve the global problems of housing, transport, education, and energy through his innovative design and writing projects. He conceived of the Earth as a beautifully designed spaceship that lacks comprehensible instructions, which he sought to provide in publishing in 1969, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. We are all astronauts in Fuller's assertion. We have not been seeing our spaceship Earth as an integrally designed machine, which to be persistently successful must be comprehended and serviced in total. In learning to successfully operate spaceship Earth and its complex life supporting and regenerating systems, humankind was confronted with the challenge of self-instruction. Earth was an operable technological object, fully accessible to humankind. Next image, please. As a young architect, Norman Foster met Buckminster Fuller in 1971 to collaborate on the construction of the Samuel Beckett Theater at Oxford. The theater, which was never built, marked the beginning of their 12-year relationship. The theater would have been a subterranean building designed to house classrooms and exhibition spaces for St. Peter's College, and it would have utilized the geodesic lightweight structures that had made Fuller famous by then. Next image, please. Yeah, here's a second image of the same theater building. Foster claims that this plan had a significant impact on the later stages of his own career. I remember that Bucky made the comparison with a submarine because the structure of the building had to be resistant to water like a seaworthy vessel. The building had to stand up to groundwater and other natural forces. So it's no coincidence my, that my later projects also take the form of ships and submarines. Next image, please. The metaphor of the ship or the submarine continues to inform Norman Foster's design work. For instance, a 2009 article in the Guardian newspaper suggested that Foster's reassuringly technical, graceful, silver, white, and immaculate designs would be suitable for architecture on the moon. More recently in 2015, Foster and Partners publicized renderings for a settlement on Mars, which would be constructed by robots prior to the arrival of humans. 
Designing for extraterrestrial environments provides an exciting platform for experimentation that's at the front line of innovative technology, one of Foster's partners commented to the Daily Mail. In relation to his recent designs for outer space, Foster has noted that he understands practicing architecture in the Arabian Gulf to be similar to lunar exploration. And news commentators have supported this take in their continued fascination with the idea of constructing an eco-friendly city in the desert. The inhospitable terrain suggests that the only way to survive here is with the maximum of technological support, a bit like living on the moon. Next image, please. In his autobiography, the leading Emirati entrepreneur and businessman Isa al Gurg asserts that the Emirati rulers also understand the desert as a moonscape. He describes how Sheikh Rashid of Dubai dismissed the moon landing as a hoax, arguing that the pictures from the moon's surface on television had obviously been filmed in the mountains of Ras al-Khaimah, one of the seven emirates that make up the UAE, specifically to delude fools like him. Next image, please. In December 2010, Fred Mohmanzadeh, then president of Mazdar Institute, appeared in a CNN documentary by Richard Quest about Mazdar City. He explained that when the US wanted to send a man to the moon, it produced NASA. Now, when the UAE wants to transform and diversify its economy, it builds Mazdar City. Next image, please. So how can we understand and conceptualize the impetus to compare Mazdar City with the moon landing or with an exploratory trip to outer space? Looking back at the Apollo space program, David Mindell, historian of science, explains how President John F. Kennedy seized and mobilized the powerful mythology of the frontier in aiming for the moon. The term frontier, originally meaning border or borderline, took on new resonance during the settlement of the American West in the 18th and 19th centuries. In this narrative, heroic pioneers headed to an unknown geography full of unpredictable dangers. There, they would make use of self-control and self-reliance to open up a new resource frontier. Next image, please. Laura's spaceship analogy also helped the producers of Mazdar City in promoting the reconfiguration of the desert as an undiscovered resource frontier from which a novel means of livelihood would emerge. The analogy served as a conceptual extension of the multiple Orientalist projects that the British or the French undertook in the 19th century to make a certain form of life possible in the arid geog geographies of Arabia. Many colonialist and settler colonialist projects have regarded the desert as this blank or ruined space, which can be fixed with the help of technology and proper governance. As geographer Diana Davis shows in her book, The Arid Lands, European colonizers have conceptualized the desert as a geography that has been generated due to mis misuse by its native peoples and therefore needs to be enhanced. This conceptualization has allowed for centuries of dispossession, especially by positioning Europeans as experts who might recreate the imagined forested landscapes of the past and therefore improve life for the said desert dwellers. For the colonizers, the desert was a terra nullius, an uncultivated frontier open for experimentation of all kinds. In this new adventure, the frontiers people of Mazdar City would be in charge, both abiding by the principles of the Abu Dhabi government and taking the initiative to produce a next generation of innovators. The frontiers people would help Abu Dhabi ensure its survival after oil by substituting fossil fuels with renewable energies. According to this destiny, students would take charge as astronauts, managing the successful institution of a new resource economy within an oil exporting country. Next image, please. The frontier narrative not only reconfigured the passengers of Mazdar City as resource pioneers, it also obfuscated the idea of resource finitude. While the Mazdar project seemingly rel relied on and reproduced the acknowledgement that fossil fuels would eventually disappear, the eco city promoted an infinity of sunlight and win wind in responding to this verdict. Perhaps fossil fuels were going to be less abundant. But this did not mean energy sources were finite and predetermined. Detached from the burdens of nature, the spaceship in the desert would journey through endless space, confirming the vision of a boundless frontier where new varieties of resources were to be discovered. 
In fulfilling its duties as a vehicle that explores outer space, the Mazdar City project would challenge and resolve the problem of finitude. Next image, please. Meanwhile, Mazdar Institute students, the frontier people of Abu Dhabi's emergent eco-city experiment, remained unsure about the translatability of Mazdar City into other settings. On February 1st, 2011, they gathered in the Mazdar Institute Auditorium to debate whether Mazdar City is an elite enclave of sustainability unsuitable for the rest of the world. The graduate students who came to Mazdar City from countries including the US, China, India, Egypt, Jordan, Iran, Turkey, and Iceland were struggling with such questions and wished to think about them in the context of a debate club performance. The team that perceived Mazdar City as an elite enclave of sustainability argued that Mazdar was too unique to be applied elsewhere. For one, Mazdar was very expensive. Which other country other than the oil-rich UAE would be able to devote $22 billion for an eco-city? Second, they recalled how the project had been put together to contribute to the economic diversification of Abu Dhabi and perhaps would not be financially feasible or meaningful for other countries with different economies. Mazdar City was expected to help the UAE transform its brand image from oil producer to technology developer to induce a perception shift, possibly attracting foreign investments or facilitating the creation of local startups focusing on clean technology. Third, the political climate of Abu Dhabi was working in favor of Mazdar City by providing prolonged commitment and stability. The government often served as a steady source of financing for the project. In this understanding, Mazdar City would remain an island contingent on a specific set of circumstances only available within the UAE. Abu Dhabi's oil capital, its future economic vision, and its political environment were thus perceived as preconditions for launching the spaceship. In response, the team that defended the global applicability of Mazdar City proposed that the eco city should be understood and framed as a prototype. Abu Dhabi would shoulder the burdens of building the eco city, and others would benefit. Every new idea is expensive, one of the students underlined. Think about the car. First, rich people had it, and now it's spread all around the world. Mazdar City could become less expensive in an undefined future. It could be exported to other countries as a whole in the same way that the car and its infrastructures have been exported. In the meantime, the experiments taking place at Mazdar City would be learning experiences for students, researchers, and faculty, opening up global horizons for research on renewable energy, for eventual adaptation to other regions in bits and pieces. At the end of the meeting, one student approached me to express his dissatisfaction at how none of the students on the debate teams had actually defined what Mazdar City was or what exactly they expected it to spread around the world. No one talked about the personal rapid transit units or the motion sensors he specified, pointing to the technological artifacts that seemingly defined the eco city for him. What would Mazdar City pass on to the rest of the world, he wondered, and what exactly was the promise the, what, what exactly was the future that the spaceship promised? Next image, please. On November 10th, 2010, some weeks before the official opening of Mazdar City, Daniel, a Foster and Partners architect overseeing the master plan, gave a talk about their design process. The students who organized the debate were in the audience. Daniel's slideshow included this lunar image, juxtaposing a space module with a gray lightweight cladding of the laboratory buildings on the Mazdar Institute campus. Next image, please. The laboratory facades that you see here in this image were composed of insulating cushions that the architects explained, shade the interiors of the building and remain cool to the touch under the desert sun. Yet while the technological infrastructure of Mazdar City was critical to the project, the architects also emphasized how they learned from all the Arab cities in designing the eco city. Next image, please. Daniel's slideshow, in fact, began with references to cities that had architectural principles akin to Mazdar. Aleppo in Syria, Marrakesh in Morocco were among the cities that inspired the city's master plan along with traditional districts within uh, other cities in the UAE and Gulf region. Many of these cities also had narrow streets, shaded windows, 
courtyards and wind towers. The audience, mainly Mazar Institute students and researchers, listened carefully and examined the image that Daniel showed, a bird's eye view of Shibam in Yemen taken by George Steinmetz, a National Geographic photographer. A student raised his hand to ask a question, interrupting the presentation. But does Shibam really exist? Have you ever seen it? Daniel replied that it was too dangerous to travel to Yemen these days, so he had never been to Shibam, and added how he would love to go there someday. But sure, Shibam existed. This city, or this historical artifact, as Daniel framed it, had been one of the primary inspirations for building Mazdar City, an eco-city that strove to be located in the future and that had its roots in a uniquely Arab past. In these presentations, the old city of Shibam lost its social, political, and even material qualities and became part of the imaginary world of Mazdar City. Did Shibam really exist? No one in the audience, including the architects, seemed to have experienced Shibam firsthand. Seen in a bird's eye view photograph in the Foster and Partners slideshow, Shibam's qualities complemented those of Mazdar. Shibam stood in for a mythical Arab past relegated to lost history and unapproachable geography. In this context, Mazar City not only served as the materialization of a displaced longing for this past, it also epitomized the expectations for a mythical Arab future under construction in Abu Dhabi. Next image, please. The official opening of the Mazdar Institute campus, perhaps a metonymical representation of Mazdar City, was scheduled for November 23, 2010. The campus, which contained laboratories, residential units, classrooms, a ca cafeteria, a coffee shop, a small gym, and a knowledge center, as well as open landscape areas between these facilities, was argued to be the first structure of its kind to be powered entirely by solar energy. Next image, please. When the day of the inauguration ceremony came, the students had important roles to play in it. And here you can see some of the students posing with uh, Norman Foster and with the president, then president and first lady of uh, Iceland. Next image, please. A day before the event, they, all the students received an email attachment with instructions on where they would be stationed throughout the ceremony and how they would approach the high profile visitors to the building, such as Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. The document specified, you need to identify yourselves and greet the guests by saying, thank you for coming to Mazdar Institute inauguration. We are delighted to have you here. We will show you to the person rapid transit cars. While six students were to welcome visitors at the Person Rapid Transit Station, 14 others were asked to be present at the Knowledge Center, reading, working on laptops, checking books at the first floor of the library, so as to allow the visitors to experience the building in operation. The remaining 100 or so students would be stationed at different locations on campus at different times. The students were provided with a fact sheet with answers to questions such as, what makes Mazdar City special? as well as reference points for their potential conversations with guests. They would redeploy Mazdar's marketing campaigns, this time through informal conversations, while making use of the half-working material artifacts on site as props. What they staged would serve as a natural representation of the future of Mazdar Institute, with busy students absorbed in their work, reading, working on laptops, checking books at the first floor of the library. When representing the Institute, it somehow made more sense to introduce that abstract future rather than showcasing the current state of indeterminacy the fledgling institution was trying to overcome. In this performance, the students did not only pretend to exist in the future, they also demonstrated the perpetual potential of the project. Next image, please. The science fiction or utopia that Mazdar Institute represented was further enacted and confirmed through high profile visits to campus. By relying on a predetermined statement about the campus, the marketing department the employees introduced to different research projects on site to their guests, which ranged from Hollywood celebrities such as Adrian Brody and James Cameron to politicians such as uh, then US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, 
to investors interested in building eco hotel chains or organic grocery stores. These high profile visits not only helped showcase the multiple advancements on clean technology, but also supported publicity campaigns in national and international media outlets. When the movie star Clive Owen toured the Mazdar Institute, for instance, his comments ran under the headline, Mazdar looks like a city from the future, Owen, in the national English language newspaper, Khalish Times. Owen, who had starred in acclaimed science fiction films such as uh, Children of Men from 2006, suggested that a science fiction film be shot at the Institute. And here in this image, you can see Clive Owen taking the tour with some of the students and the marketing staff from Mazdar. Next image, please. Many others saw the marketing and communications campaigns as portraying a science fiction project. In describing the city, many refer to films such as The Fifth Element from 1997, Total Recall from 1990, Blade Runner from 1982, and Margaret Atwood's uh, recent novel, Oryx and the Craig from 2003 was also considered a good analog. Most of these works are set in bounded cityscapes where life is impossible outside technologically supported zones. Soon Mazdar's promoters forecast, life would need to be sequestered in enclosed and self-sufficient spaces due to climate change and energy issues. As a city built from scratch, Mazdar offered a vision of a technologically complex, eco-friendly and enjoyable modes of living and aimed to serve as a potential engine for economic growth. But the future that animated interest in this complex was at times dark. By the logic of Mazdar's marketing campaign, the time and space of Mazdar city was at once apocalyptic and utopian. Next image, please. Indeed, when executives working with Mazdar city utilized analogies based in science fiction narratives, they received tongue in cheek criticism from reviewers. An environmental news website quipped, for instance, Mazdar City is bringing Blade Runner to the fore. No one wants to live in a city full of replicants, even if it's eco-friendly. Someone better call Deckard to fix this mess before it gets out of hand. The news website pointed out that many works of science fiction are critiques of totalizing environments where corporate power looms large, the police seem omnipresent, and large-scale social problems remain inevitable despite extensive rational planning. At the same time, Blade Runner signified the future that had already passed. Mazdar City was relying on and reproducing an imaginary of the future dating back as far as the 1960s. It was not necessarily generating the fresh and innovative future that its marketers promised. Next image, please. Anyhow, when they stop building it and finally give up on the clean technology cluster, Mazdar City will probably transform into an amusement park, don't you think? Selim, a Mazdar Institute student, wondered aloud. He was referring to spaces that were originally conceived of as futuristic communities, but later abandoned to constitute objects of amusement. Most famously, Walt Disney's Epcot Center, planned for 20,000 residents on a plot of land in Orlando, Florida, which then became the site of the theme park Epcot after his death. According to Selim, in a few decades, people would come and visit the ruins of an eco city, or what was meant to be an eco city, where the ruins would signify not only decay, but also traces of an idea once pursued ambitiously. In this imagined future, Mazdar city would become more of a spectacle, and its ruin would once again offer entertainment to its spectators, in addition to nostalgia for a past where the option of a renewable energy and clean technology future was still available. Yet the specter of ruination denoted how technological solutions are always so close to complete breakdown as opposed to indeterminate potential. Next image, please. These narratives are very significant in shaping Mazdar, but before closing, let's take a quick look at how exactly the spaceship gets fueled. So in this image here, you can see the uh, beam down concentrated solar power station, which was a collaborative project carried out by MIT and Mazdar Institute researchers inside Mazdar City. And it relies on uh, the mirrors that surround the tower uh, to reflect uh, solar beams. 
As some of you may know, Abu Dhabi is perceived to be a perfect location for harnessing solar energy. However, according to Mahmoud, a 30-something Egyptian-born engineer at Mazdar, this perception was not completely accurate. Upon finishing his PhD at an American university and wishing to be closer to home, Mahmoud had accepted a position at Mazdar as his first job. As we chatted outside the solar power station, he stated that high levels of dust and humidity were blocking direct solar rays and causing thick coatings on the solar panels, diminishing their effective functioning. Although we can't fix this problem that easily, we have found a solution for it, he continued. We call it a man with a brush. Next image, please. And here's an image of the man with a brush. And in the back there, you can see the Mazdar Institute uh, dorms and labs. In Mahmoud's understanding, the man with a brush, a worker dedicated to gently wiping away dust and mud from the solar panels, became part of the picture only to reveal the infrastructural potential embedded within the solar panels. Man with a brush could perform a feat that extensive technological innovation couldn't so far handle and therefore was fundamental to the emergent clean technology sector of Abu Dhabi. The man with the brush was South Asian or perhaps from the Philippines. He shared a room with other workers in a labor camp outside Abu Dhabi, and he walked around the Mazdar city site, cleaning solar panels on a daily basis. Overall, the immigrant labor force served as a most effective and essential resource for the materialization and functioning of renewable energy infrastructure in the UAE. Yet these humans who were making the infrastructures work were most often perceived as disposable tools. Mazdar City attempted to help humanity fight climate change and energy scarcity problems, but its understanding of humanity was particular and selective. It did not include the man with a brush. At Mazdar City, oil would cease to be the main currency. Driverless electric pods would replace cars and eventually, possible environmental problems would be avoided through meticulous research and technological discovery. Relayed as a science fiction style narrative, the social and political injustices did not seem to matter much. Next image, please. In this context, Mazdar remained an exclusive project that aspired to prolong the current social and political conditions by making use of technical adjustments. It supported a conception of utopia or science fiction that did not take into account an improved future for the whole of humanity. The implication was that the status quo was already a best case scenario. The producers of Mazar City already inhabited this utopia, even though this utopia did not necessarily plan for the man with the brush or many others who were not included within its confines. In constructing an eco-city, they were building a limited notion of what humanity means and strengthening existing social boundaries. But in fact, climate change and energy issues should propel humans to challenge such boundaries and to cultivate new modes of inhabiting the planet. Thank you so much. You're muted, Paz. Oh, I am muted. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, use the Q&A button to ask questions. Uh, and uh, I, I wanted to start by, by saying uh, how interesting it is to kind of think about the cultures that are supposed to be meeting, at, at least in my mind, uh, in this kind of new city. Uh, and I think that, you know, like this is a, is it still 2030? Because the, the projected kind of end date uh, for, for uh, building it. And like, I'm, I'm guessing that like different ideas around science fiction and, you know, like this is like, it can be like the Dune world where, you know, water is the catalyst and, you know, then you got the spice that kind of runs like the oil, you know, across the galaxies and kind of do, you know, uh, and, and kind of thinking 
where does water play here? Like, you know, this is the desert. We, we have, you know, the, the wind is gonna be uh, used. Is there a new way that uh, water is gonna be or thought of uh, and utilized in, in this world uh, or this kind of cocoon city? And uh, the other question I had had to do with language and kind of thinking, you know, like what type, you know, I'm, I'm drawn to the uh, Blade Runner idea and kind of thinking, you know, the different layers of society kind of trying to uh, exist uh, together in this kind of multifaceted world and kind of thinking, you know, like, is there a way to uh, connect to like this kind of mishmash language, the uh, speak uh, cyber, I, I forgot the name that uh, Blade Runner uh, language is, is uh, being utilized at least in the movie. But uh, this is like the Institute is a confluence of all those people coming from everywhere. Uh, and then they are speaking certain, uh, maybe English when they're presenting, you know, the, the vision. And then the uh, connection between that to Arabic and to kind of, you know, like how, how does it interplay with uh, that future? What's gonna happen in 2030? Is it gonna be like a, a very, uh, uh, centered on uh, culture that is familiar to the uh, people that live there, or is that another kind of vision that needs to somehow kind of connect? So I guess uh, I asked two co different questions, uh, and I'm sorry about that, but I, I thought about water as you were speaking and thought about uh, how do people communicate that future with each other and that's not far away from many other big cities, right? So like the, there is this, what happens in the train <laughs> when people switch from, you know, like their current existence to the future, you know, do they switch a language? Thank you for those questions. I'll start with the 2030 vision just because it's such a, you know, um, overarching sort of, uh, I guess, framework for all Gulf countries today. So on every country in the, uh, Gulf uh, Cooperation Council, I think Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, the UAE, they all have Vision 2030 uh, as a, you know, as a project that they circulate. Uh, what's shared in all of these visions is a sort of a, a project, well, there are certain qualities that are shared across the board. One is the aspiration to diversify all of these economies. Um, so to think about other ways in which um, um, the Gulf countries can sort of uh, support themselves at, for, at a time beyond oil. So if the oil prices uh, are the fall or if oil becomes undesirable as a commodity in the future, how will, the, how will these countries sustain the current level of welfare that they enjoy? So in all of the, the different sort of uh, places have taken up different kind of responses to this. So for instance, um, Qatar now is hosting the World Cup, for instance, and investing in sort of um, tourism and sports infrastructure as a possible way in which they can sort of, um, you know, uh, sustain their economy. Or in the UAE, the investment in renewable energy and clean technology was a prominent uh, part of this sort of this imagined package, and it's co complemented with other kinds of cultural institutions and educational institutions that I uh, talked about briefly in the beginning of the talk. Saudi Arabia has uh, the same kind of um, sort of existential concerns, I think, and and now um, those of you who've sort of been sort of looking at sort of urban developments over the summer, you may have seen the sort of the the now very sort of uh, hyped sort of the Saudi project, which called Neom, which is sort of seeking to build a brand new sort of region that will have three cities in it that will focus on artificial intelligence and surveillance technology. So that becomes a sort of a part of the vision 2030 for, for Saudi Arabia. And across the Gulf, uh, artificial intelligence and surveillance technologies are um, becoming quite popular for the uh, for decision makers. And so, Within that space, um, Mazdar City was born in that space uh, as a project, but uh, as it transformed over the years since basically it's launched in 2006 till say now, what happened is that uh, the master plan was canceled. And once the master plan was canceled, the city became a space that's more of a special economic zone for non-oil energy uh, sources. 
So currently there's a, a, a nuclear power station in Abu Dhabi and the, that nuclear power station is um, sort of has its sort of uh, management unit at Mazdar City. Uh, there's also International Renewable Energy Agency has its headquarters inside Mazdar City. And so that was considered a major sort of uh, diplomatic victory for the UAE when they convinced the sort of the world to host the, uh, the International Renewable Energy headquarters in Abu Dhabi. And so, um, so but, but the kind of the project did not necessarily transform in the way it was imagined. It's not the kind of the zero carbon smart eco city that it, that was that it was imagined to be. In now, when I the last time I was in the UAE was right before the pandemic, and when I asked people there in early 2020 what they thought about Mazdar City, they said, "Well, it's a quiet suburb of Abu Dhabi, so you can go there to relax. There's not that much going on. There's a big mall there now, and there are some sort of um, uh, sort of units like residential units called the eco villas or that people can sort of work people can rent apartments and the Mazdar Institute was closed um and sort of absorbed by another university in uh Abu Dhabi called Khalifa University and so now instead of Mazdar Institute there's a uh, artificial intelligence and surveillance focused uh, university at, in those same buildings that I just showed you, uh, that's run by a sort of a, a collaboration with, the, with, with China. And so, and when I was visiting in early 2020, the, this new university hadn't yet started and Mazdar Institute had already been closed. So although the lab spaces were being used by students and researchers, the residential units had been open to flight attendants. So Etihad, which is the sort of the um, Abu Dhabi's uh, airline, uh, hosted its flight attendants in, in these units at the Mazdar Institute campus. So, uh, so you can see that the kind of the imagination of the project versus the lived reality of the project uh, don't necessarily correspond. Here, I'm mainly doing the work of sort of analyzing what that imagination was and what that imagination wanted to do. But of course, it's uh, in the larger book project, I look at sort of how this imagination uh, matches or does not match in many instances with the kind of everyday experiences of people at, at Mazdar City. So with the water question, this is, I think, a very important question, and I've written about uh, sort of water technologies in uh, in the Arabian Peninsula as well. So uh, in here, I talk briefly about the sort of how the there's an imagination of infinite oil in in the or infinite energy, even if not in, there isn't infinite oil, hope there is a sort of a push for the infinity of energy uh, in in Abu Dhabi, and so. That infinity of energy also has parallels the kind of a discourse on water, where there is a sort of a in, belief in the infinity of water, and that water obviously it's a very it's a sort of a the uh, water as a resource has to be produced. It's a uh, it's not it, the all the aquifers, all the sort of the groundwater resources have, most of them have already been sort of um, depleted. And so desalination infrastructures have become critical to survival in the Arabian Peninsula overall. So there were many different kinds of technological projects that are all really uh, sort of um, interesting to sort of look at. So for instance, in the, uh, I believe in the late sixties, early seventies, one of the projects was to sort of carry an iceberg uh, to uh, Saudi Arabia to make uh, water available to Saudi through the sort of the melting of that iceberg on the Saudi coast. So, um, so there have been many different kinds of technologies to sort of think about water resources, but desalination is currently the sort of the most, uh, the most popular uh, way of accessing water. And desalination is a very energy intensive process and it produces brine that's not good for the uh, Gulf sort of water uh, quality, and that generates something called red tide, which is bad for tourism infrastructure. And so, but there's work to sort of um, perhaps sort of uh, slightly transform um, desalination infrastructure to sort of, uh, to mitigate some of the environmental sort of, uh, to mitigate some of the environmental damage that it does by making it sort of um, powered by solar 
uh, solar energy, etc. But then I think there's also uh, over the years I'm, I've observed a certain kind of um, a coming to terms with the arid lands as well. So instead of maybe uh, trying to have like green lawns outside every house, maybe rock gardens or sort of just leaving the sort of the arid land as it is, is also becoming more and more acceptable, I think. So there needs to be a certain kind of cultural shift that um, that sort of, uh, that generates that kind of um, that, that generates a different kind of relationship with the desert in order for water resources to be um, uh, consumed differently. So yeah, so that's the water question. Yeah, now maybe I can look at some of the questions that are in the Q and A, and then yeah, there, was, there were several questions about what's going on there now. Uh, so uh, how many people live there? Uh, is um, basically how do people that live there react to this vision and uh, you know like that uh, yeah how, how, how is it working out yeah yeah I guess yeah I mean there, there aren't I mean there's very few people who live there in the eco villas and I think now there must be students that are sort of part of the sort of the artificial intelligence program that are living in the dorms uh but it's not uh it's not a it's not necessarily the kind of residential sort of uh you know space that it was going to be and so many people the Siemens has a headquarters there and Mazdar has its headquarters there so there are many people who work in those places and who commute to Mazdar uh in order to sort of you know, it, for the to, for their sort of daily activities, uh, but it doesn't the in a way the time that I was that I'm talking about here, the sort of the early 2010s, was a really critical period for the Mazdar City project because they had a student study student population there, and those students were able to were also serving as test subjects for this for this project. So. Uh, in one part of the book, I write about a sort of an experiment uh, on a sort of a, uh, on building an energy-based currency. So one of the scientists or some of the scientists at Mazda Institute had this idea that in the future, uh, money should be abolished in the way that it is, and everyone should be issued kilowatt hours instead of, you know, dollars or um, dirhams. And so... This is a kind of relatively also an old idea. It's kind of uh, it emerges every once in a while since the 1930s. It's become so it's been experimented with in different points. And now actually the kind of I see the the emergence of Bitcoin very much as a sort of an energy currency in itself. So we're seeing a sort of a comeback of the of energy currencies, even uh, even today in a very different kind of form. But the uh, but as they were testing out how energy currencies could work. Uh, they were trying to sort of they built a sort of an intelligent building management system that would track the students uh, electricity consumption and that would allow them to sort of see how they you know how they could actually uh, incentivize students to um, consume less electricity for instance either by showing them their neighbors consumption patterns or making electricity more expensive uh, as you know as uh, their consumption levels increased Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So there were different kinds of experiments like this uh, energy currency experiment that was that were happening on site, which took advantage of the fact that the students were there as test subjects, and the students were all maybe, uh, perhaps all in their twenties or maybe early thirties, but they came from all around the world and they served as a sort of a very diverse kind of uh, pool for testing this, uh, testing out some of these ideas, and they did uh, often complain about the fact or not maybe complain is too strong a word, but acknowledge the fact that they were seen as test subjects in this space. Yeah. Um, David yeah. here uh, is asking exactly about that, uh, David Casagrande. So uh, if you've been able to keep track of the students uh, and uh, he's curious to know if the experience changed them and if they may think more about the social implications of technology. Uh, yeah, that's a, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I have kept in touch with some of them, uh, maybe not all of them, but uh, I see many of them also on social media, and I see that they have actually many of them have gone on to do PhDs in different kinds of topics that relate to uh, sort of sustainability or climate change or urbanism, 
And so I think this experience left them with a lot to think about. And so now there, many of them are trying to sort of unpack their experiences through their, through, um, you know, studying related topics that are not necessarily about Mazdar City, but that touch up, that touch upon sort of energy and climate change issues very broadly. And um, some of them have stayed in Abu Dhabi, but many others have, um, many of them have actually left and moved on to other places. One of the things that's I think uh, kind of interesting about the student body is that there was a lot of uh, emphasis on how the student body would produce uh, startups. And because you know the ideal here is that, um, that Abu Dhabi will transform into a kind of Silicon Valley and will produce again, technologically sort of uh, like knowledge-based uh, products rather than oil. And so, uh, that imagination of a sort of a, a world of startups didn't necessarily come to fruition in the way that it was imagined. And that's one of the reasons why the Mazdar Institute was no longer supported by the, um, by the decision makers in Abu Dhabi. And so, um, and, and people at Mazdar Institute, administrators or researchers would say, you know, this is like a, they, why, they, this is the time that it takes a long time for that kind of startup culture to, uh, you know, to flourish. And so um, they complained about the sort of the pressure to uh, produce that uh, startup culture very quickly. Mm -hmm. And but yeah, but I think those were some of the tensions that people um, tried to sort of navigate as they were, you know, doing their uh, daily jobs there and try to sort of understand what the expectations from students should be and what the students are actually taking away from this experience and how they're, um, uh, how they sort of, uh, uh, they're reacting to again, uh, the, their everyday realities. I and mean, Laura, the person whose blog I shared earlier in the talk, uh, moved to Ghana after this, uh, after uh, finishing her master's degree at Mazdar and became involved with sort of humanitarian uh, renewable energy technologies. Uh, I don't think she's still there now, but um, but yeah, but that was like her one of the, the reactions she had to this was to sort of talk about sort of or to think about how what are ways in which sort of uh, in, uh, these uh, technologies can become more sort of inclusive. Yeah. There is a question by Alison Mikkel. Uh, the, uh, she, um, she says, your work makes clear how this case study exemplifies the uh, Emirates' interest in portraying an image of itself as a scientifically advanced and futuristic. Uh, how does it fit with other ways that the Emirates and other Gulf states are working to push back against longstanding Orientalist perceptions of Arab nations, uh, i.e. for cultural heritage efforts, tourism, higher education, et cetera? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I mean, um, I think there is a there is a so much some of this work that happens here. I think shows that there is a sort of a pushback against the Orientalist Im imagery of the sort of uh, of uh, the Arab world. Um, again, as you said in the, in your question, how there is a certain uh, attempt to sort of uh, portray the country as a scientifically advanced and futuristic place, but then. Some of it also takes on that kind of, um, I think, Orientalist critique and internalizes it, for instance, in the way that the desert is perceived as an empty space. This is an Orientalist imagery of the desert, which doesn't match the uh, lived experience of the desert. For instance, in that uh, Life magazine uh, article that I showed that has the uh, sort of the beautiful Sheikh Shahput image, uh, the story is about, I mean, it is an Orientalist story, uh, of course, but even in its Orientalism, the story is about sort of how Sheikh Shahput uh, accepts the people to his uh, majlis and to talk to them in order to sort of have answered their questions. He asks them, so what are the, where are the sort of the water sort of resources in your, in the place that you hail from? And so he is very much sort of invested in maintaining having his uh, sort of, you know, people sort of uh, have a sort of an understanding of local realities. Uh, and, and so now uh, when we think about the, the kind of uh, how, how that era is perceived in the UAE, I think it's fascinating to see um, how the sort of the current sort of the youth uh, understand the lives of their grandfathers. So the lives of life before uh, before oil, 
or maybe great grandfathers at this point. But the, um, for instance, at Mazdar Institute, one of the, you know, this is a very sort of common kind of like university sort of activity where there's, you know, counters uh, dedicated to different countries and those uh, students from those countries come around and like show, talk about their countries and, you know, talk about sort of the stereotypical things related to their countries, etc. In the stand for the UAE, the, uh, the Emirati students had uh, that, that they'd set up, they'd brought their grand, uh, a grandfather of theirs in order to sort of show what the UAE was about. And this grandfather was a, was a man who knew how to, you know, how to navigate the desert. He knew how to sort of bird and he knew how, you know, and so he seemed like such a, so the students were completely exoticizing their own grandparents as a, and sort of showing how alienated they are actually from the sort of the kinds of people that inhabited these landscapes before the discovery of oil. So, so I think, I mean, the question about is very interesting because it is very much about also generational responses to sort of depictions of the UAE and, and how the sort of the, the people that are sort of, that have grown up with the support of oil um, uh, understand that Orientalism so differently from the, uh, from uh, their, uh, from the, their parents, grandparents' generations. And there is a certain, there is a sort of, uh, uh, I've written about sort of the, how, uh, how, the, um, how the, the diverse understandings of the future in the Gulf. And one of the sort of the sources that I enjoy looking at is a um, art move, uh, sort of a, an art movement, I guess we can call it, called Gulf Futurism, which has uh, different kinds of artists talking about sort of or making art around sort of their versions of what the future should be like. So in order to sort of push back against these kinds of official sort of depictions of Blade Runner futures, they either sort of, you know, they either poke fun at this, these kinds of imaginaries or again, craft their own versions of what they think the future uh, is going to be like, or should be like, or uh, or can be critical of again of these official narratives. So I think there's also a very productive conversation happening there in responding to the sort of the again the the broad uh, sort of Orientalist understandings uh, of the Arabian Peninsula. Yeah, yeah uh, well, I, I I do come from a country that um, you know uh, Israel that kind of uh, brings wants to bring ice from different places and is a high-tech country that you know like does uh, uh, talk about it a lot but obviously most of the country uh, is different and <laughs> still tries to kind of accommodate uh, those dreams uh, and uh, Bruce is asking um, Bruce Whitehouse about uh, a foreign uh, the, that dream and how do ordinary people in Abu Dhabi make of it and do they also expect that it will not live up to its designer's promises? And I guess maybe to add to it is how is it being talked about? You know, like the, the changes and, you know, uh, in terms of the government or the way that it's still being promoted. And then, you know, like how, how does that dream that used to be there still resonates uh, with the folks that the, the ordinary people, which are particular, uh, I guess, uh, um, uh, people that are citizens, right, uh, in that area? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I don't, I frankly don't know whether the, I mean, how, I mean, there was a lot of support among citizens of uh, sort of the like UAE for all, of, for all of these um, diversification projects. Like, for instance, I think one way of thinking about it, which is quite fascinating to me is when in earlier in this uh when the project was sort of uh publicized the you know uh, people were writing about it and uh, you know in various newspapers or talking about it in general were were saying oh this is so you know paradoxical this uh, eco city sits right next to the airport not right next to a golf course right next to the formula one tracks how is this possible for this kind of urbanism to actually make any kind of claim to sustainability? But from the perspective of the uh, uh, Emirati citizens or from the perspective of decision makers, it made uh, complete sense because all of these were different kinds of strategies for economic diversification that were happening side by side. And all of these uh, sort of 
strategies took advantage of the fact that the UAE was so uh, invested in oil networks and oil production and, and tried to sort of project what that, uh, how that oil produ production could have influenced the future. So maybe the Formula One tracks are going to be the way sort of uh, to think about uh, a, a different way of uh, inhabiting the UAE uh, post oil. Uh, or maybe um, the airport will actually become a very important hub that will support the country. You know, there's all these, of course, you can criticize those imaginaries uh, in themselves, but there's a certain kind of broader, I think, um, sort of um, investment in thinking about how the country could uh, be after, after oil. Um, and so you can see that there's, a, I think there's a, a, a general kind of, um, uh, investment in ideas of progress here. So for instance, um, the, some of the work that I've, you, I've learned from in building and sort of writing this book comes from uh, Oman. And so Mandana Limbert wrote a book about in the time of oil, where she talks about how in the case of Oman, um, the period of having oil or enjoying oil sort of abundance was seen like a dream. And many of the people that she talks to in the book say, when, what are we going to do when we wake up? So maybe we should prepare for a return to a, 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 a past, the sort of the pre-oil past, and how, imagine our futures to look more like that pre-oil past. But that was not the, that was not the sentiment that I uh, observed amongst, amongst sort of people in the Emirates. There was much more of a sort of a, a prog much more of a progress oriented thinking where sort of these were ideas around sort of business models, technology and design solutions would actually uh, generate uh, a, a, a new era, a, a yet again, sort of a different kind of, uh, Sort of a sophisticated um, sort of sense of welfare for the uh, for the Emirates. So so that sense of return was not that kind of cyclical temporality was not something that I found there. And so so I think that's that's one way of thinking about how the ordinary people of the of the Emirates responded to it. And also if you think about sort of the Emirates as a whole, I mean. Abu Dhabi sits at the sort of the heart of the financial heart of the UAE. So not every emirate is as wealthy or as powerful as Abu Dhabi. And so, uh, so the, um, for instance, in 2008, when all the other master plan sort of city projects or real estate development projects were sort of uh, collapsing, Mazdar city could still sort of uh, continue as a, as, as a sort of a, as an urban development project because uh, of Abu Dhabi's oil wealth. So I think that's a kind of a, um, that's also important to keep in mind as we're talking about the Emirati citizen because the Emirati citizens, some of them are uh, residents of Abu Dhabi while others are, are not. And so there's also kind of a, a, a different kind of hierarchy there that uh, that might be felt um, when engaging with projects like this. Mm -hmm. Um, Ken Kodama is asking uh, the production of food. So uh, in Biosphere 2, it was self-contained and they grew their own food. Uh, is Master City's food imported? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. And it, I think sort of also echoes uh, your question was about water. So the so this is a big issue and it was since day one i mean i you know in the early in 2007 2008 before i'd ever sort of even uh visited the mazdar city site i started following people who were giving talks about mazdar city in the us around sort of uh in institutions here and whenever someone gave a, from from uh mazdar would give a talk the first question would be exactly your question so what about food how is food going to be sort of uh sustained here and so uh so the most of the food was imported at the time i mean there's been a uh, and there's been um, land grabbing projects from East Africa uh, financed by the UAE where sort of the, um, where the sort of the uh, where UAE cultivates fields in East Africa and imports that I mean and carries that food basically to the Emirates. And there's been a general interest in agricultural technologies in order to uh, make uh, food production more uh, sort of a I guess domestically sort of viable, but the food is very much sort of um, important. And there is uh, there was a sort of a, in the early days of the project when the there was a claim to make Mazdar City zero carbon. Uh, the various experts who were part of this project said, okay, let's lay out 
a spreadsheet and explain how does this zero carbon sort of infrastructure work? What do we include in uh, in the sort of the in our carbon emissions? Are people who are flying out to visit their families and wherever they're from, are do their flights uh, how you know fit inside our spreadsheet, or do we see that as an externality and don't necessarily treat that as part of our larger calculation around sort of the zero carbonness of the city? Food was exactly the same. So how about imported food? Should we actually look at how uh, sort of the apple that you can sort of get in the cafeteria at Mazdar City, uh, how did that apple get produced and how did that apple actually get transported? How is it being maintained there with like refrigeration infrastructure and everything? And so do we account for the carbon emissions born from that? And so this debate went on for weeks and as a result, it became so um, complicated that the decision was to just drop the claim zero carbon. And to say that there are so many externalities that you need to actually account for if you want to truly claim that your project is going to be zero carbon, that it becomes impossible to even sort of track all of those externalities. And so it becomes a kind of a, a, actually a global project. So this is because this is not you can't necessarily treat it as a little sort of a, uh, you know, as the insulated hub that it claims to be as the spaceship that it claims to be. So even that exercise of trying to see what zero carbon meant showed that the city was not a spaceship, even though that was the sort of the imagination of it, that it relied very much on um, outside, um, outside support and different kinds of technologies. But I mean, but it's interesting because for instance, now uh, I was recently in, in, uh, in Qatar and I was sort of looking at sort of how the blockade there has affected sort of the same question because all of a sudden Qatar, all of trade networks around Qatar were cut off and Qatar was kind of, I guess, maybe not exactly, but a little bit turned into a spaceship in its own way. And so, and so uh, since 2017, the people in, in Doha have been saying that there's been so much investment in agriculture technologies that uh, domestic food production has grown by 400% in five years. And so I think in uh, food security issues are also kind of becoming more and more intrinsically tied to sort of questions around climate change and questions around energy security. So, so I, um, so I think we might see more and more of an investment in sort of agricultural technologies in supporting uh, future visions like this. But again, I think your question shows that 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 kind of imagination of isolation, imagination of sort of the biosphere to life cannot necessarily, uh, is, is not necessarily what maybe we should be calling for, but maybe it's a, an equitable distribution of the resources we have on earth is, it would be a more sustainable way of thinking about how to live life uh, under climate change. And one more thing about biosphere too, is that, I mean, it, the food production was supposed to take place there, but all of those scientists lost half their body weight during the year that they spent there. So uh, even there under those very experimental conditions, it, the project could, could not necessarily withstand itself. And, and finally, when someone actually cut themselves while they were doing something inside the biosphere too, they had to open the sort of the vault and have that person be taken to a hospital in Tucson so that the person would I think would not lose their lose a finger. So, so you know, there's all these sort of again these ideas around sort of uh, that um, sort of uh, I guess idealize isolation as an ultimate solution to all kinds of social ills. Idealize this kind of bunker logic uh, against as a way of sort of thinking about climate change. I think dismiss how how actually how much humans enjoy the connections that they have with the outside world, with each other and with the kinds of, uh, with various kinds of institutions. And so, so I think, uh, yeah, the, the, the sort of the, the spaceship logic, even though it's being sort of very much sort of brought up very often by now by tech entrepreneurs and libertarians is not necessarily uh, perhaps the way to think about how we should uh, uh, resolve climate change. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, kind of very much connected to what you were just talking about, uh, there is a question uh, about the connection or mimetic relationship between the Moon program and Mustar. Uh, so uh, do Mustar's cultural origins in the American frontier uh, transpose onto the space program, doom it from the start? <laughs> so, uh, and, and I like the losing the weight kind of as like, 
as a metaphor uh, to to all of this as as a byproduct of you know space exploration, I guess. Uh, but, mm -hmm. Yeah. What What do you think about that relationship? I mean, yeah. I I don't know uh, how. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know about being do, dooming it from the start, frankly, because, um, yeah, the, I think one of the things that maybe that the relationship, the conceptual relationship between the space program and the sort of the, and Mazdar City, I think shows how the sort of the settler colonial logic of the space program and the settler colonial logic of the sort of of the Mazdar City project uh, share certain kinds of, um, um, I guess, uh, principles. Maybe, maybe we can call it that. And so, and that that being the sort of the the imagining uh, your environment as being um, infinitely pliable, and and as and so, if you think about the sort of the early uh, settler colonial logics that made uh, that were sort of the um, on top of the agenda as the sort of the, um, um, as the Americas were being sort of colonized. Uh, one of the things that, you know, the, the John Locke sort of said was that, you know, people are not necessarily making good use of the environments that they have here. Uh, we should reclaim it from them and we, we will make better use of those environments. We will make more out of those environments. And so as a result, because we'll be better sort of uh, more, we will be more efficient producers, we should be the sort of the rightful owners of these environments. So, so there's a certain kind of, uh, obviously the kind of dispossession that happened uh, through settler colonialism was uh, legitimized through this kind of, so through this kind of idea, through the ideas around expertise, right? And so, so I'm just kind of, I guess, curious about how this happens in a context like this, where there is a sort of an imagination uh, of the sort of the uh, of the desert as a space that's not necessarily being used in the way that it should be used of the and of 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 the space uh, and of the desert as a space that has this uh, added potential that can be again pliable, that can be sort of that can generate this infinite energy. Even though all the wealth and all the sort of the you know that all the sort of the resources that actually make the make the Mazdar City project possible actually come from the desert, right? And so and so all the uh, but there is still there is a sort of an ambition around and this is a settler colonial ambition around sort of how to uh, repurpose these landscapes and how to sort of then claim ownership of these landscapes through a certain um, uh, through uh, narratives of productivity and narratives of sort of, um, again, being the sort of the right people to sort of uh, um, to transform these landscapes in the way that they need to be transformed. So I think there is, if we wanted to sort of think about the historical continuities between the sort of the space program and Mazdar City, there's, I guess, one more historical layer that we could sort of, if we see this as sort of an uh, sort of, um, yeah, as a multi-layered sort of historical project, then you could also reflect on these kind of um, 18th, 19th century histories and think about how settler colonialism made itself known uh, in the US context in that moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I, the last question I'm gonna ask for the day, and I'm sorry if I skipped some, uh, is more general and uh, kind of, I, I guess, <laughs> coming from your perspective, looking into all those things, and uh, so uh, Wei Min Wang is asking, in what sense ordinary people, so not just researchers and scientists uh, from different countries can help to promote the emissions-free society? So if you have like, you know, your own take, I guess, on what can we do? <laughs> and, you know, assuming we're not researchers, scientists, librarians, you know, go to a library and have a, have a good <laughs> environmental uh, read. Um, what, what do you think? Is there something we should be doing? I think one of the things that, uh, I mean, um, one of the things I think that we should be doing is to think of sort of, I guess maybe this is too general a thing to say, but to think, understand climate change as a political problem. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we know what needs to happen in order to uh, you know, stop climate change. If we stopped using fossil fuels today, then climate change would very easily be sort of, uh, you know, 
it would, would definitely would definitely be sort of uh, on track to sort of start mitigating some of the impacts of climate change. Uh, or, uh, but obviously we live in a in a kind of uh, social political context where that doesn't seem like a possibility, and so much of the sort of the conversation then uh, is very much about sort of individual responsibility and we see the sort of if you look at the sort of the emergence of the idea of the carbon footprint from the 80s and the 90s up till now how uh, this, these kinds of larger institutional responsibilities around climate change have then been sort of transferred to individuals and to have to make individuals responsible for their particular sort of consumption habits and for the kinds of um you know, uh, for the kind of tracking of their uh, resource use, etc. So I'm not necessarily, I think this is a, a very responsible thing for all of us to do, to think about how we consume and to think about, to, to set up like a, a particular kind of stance against sort of capitalist consumerism. But then again, I think uh, this, this kind of insistence becomes problematic when it actually allows institutions to carry forward with whatever policies that they have and to sort of think about uh, uh, to to like let go of the kinds of accountability that they they need to have, and so um, yeah, so I think there is a certain kind of in which there's ways in which we can change our everyday lives, but maybe it's more critical to sort of actually keep putting emphasis on transformation at the wider scale, at the institutional scale. So, for instance, if you go to climate summits, uh, you'll see that there is. Uh, uh, many uh, activists there claim that there needs to be a top-down sort of a transformation for climate change to actually be mitigated or adapted to. So that top-down transformation means taking, uh, making policies at the global level that will prevent the sort of the, uh, the, the sort of the ex, you know the further carbon emissions in different ways, or that will promote efficiency, that will promote uh, you know projects against that might actually. Um, uh, that are that would be seen as against capitalist consumerism, and and so the, this logic of the top down is very much countered by. So I sometimes I've done some research here in Houston amongst oil company executives, and oil company executives will say, well, it, there needs to be a bottom up response to to climate change, and the bottom as they see it now is uh, is themselves, and so they see themselves as being the sort of the bottom that needs to sort of, that can maybe attend to climate change. Uh, and they don't necessarily, a few of these uh, people that I've interviewed over the years actually acknowledge that climate change is um, as a result of human actions. They say see it as a sort of a natural thing that's happening. And so in that space, they say, well, let the oil companies uh, make those decisions about how we need to transition from oil to other kinds of fuels. So let, I guess now we call them energy companies, let energy companies make that decision. So they see these kinds of larger scale mechanisms like carbon markets, for instance, even though those carbon markets are also operating within a sort of a capitalist realm, they see those carbon markets as being, so, uh, I mean, this is, uh, I've written about this in, in a piece on, um, uh, that I published a few years ago, they see carbon markets as socialist mechanisms that they that are there to actually prevent the sort of prevent them from fully realizing their own sort of uh, uh, you know transform energy transition projects. And so, so I think there's a uh, you know, I think you're touching upon a very important point and where there is a lot of debate about how to be. And one of the uh, texts that I really have liked uh, recently is a uh, Hannah Knox's book, uh, Living Like, um, Thinking Like a Climate. And in that book, uh, the author basically talks about how people struggle with the sort of what to do. And so it, the book is set in Manchester and different groups of people in Manchester come together to discuss, okay, so how should we live? And so should we buy smart appliances for our homes? Or should we politicize around different kinds of purposes and like lobby our governments? Or should we stop flying? Should we? And so there's all these kinds of questions that get asked by the people uh, that uh, she's doing research on, and that that lead to sort of very interesting discussions. So I think that's a, that's also a good resource to sort of look at for for how different uh, groups of people sort of uh, reflect on this very question. Cool, I wrote it down. We're gonna get it if we don't have it already. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, 
So thank you so much, uh, 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 Professor okay. Gunnell. Oops, she's uh, my, my my watch is also thanking you. Uh, <laughs> so it, it was great to uh, hear you speak about this topic, and and uh, nice to have everybody around. And thank you for sticking with us this far. Uh, and uh, please come to the next uh, uh, speaking event in November fifteenth. Uh, and we're going to send more notes and thank you, Kathy, uh, for publicizing uh, the Friends events and uh, making sure that we, we know where they happen. Uh, so uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Uh, and have a nice evening. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Lois, for, the, for, the, for helping me with the uh, PDF. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. everyone, for your questions you. and for the conversation. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye.